a bit more serious now. So we know our industry is plagued with a lot of shortcomings and pitfalls. Um, this is across board to all three of you. What can the government do to make the Nigerian fashion? I know Artis Shoma is holding our head that infamous start? question. Um, fashion industry more viable and um, investment opportunities for investors so that they can actually feel comfortable investing in the space here. <laughs> <laughs> She's looking at me. She's like, really got like two about? hours what? for me. She's like, really no, talking? do you know what? Okay. Uh, infrastructure. Real. The infrastructure needs to be built. The government needs to understand that fashion and music, it it brings in a lot of money, to, you know, to a country, to a region. Um, whereas I feel like our government still th feel like fashion and music is just it's like it's like a hobby. They, they don't they don't understand, you know. Um, how much money having a high, a high street. Like, we don't have a high street in Nigeria. We don't have, like, a shopping mall with a variety of, like, clothing outlets. And I'm not just talking about high-end. I'm talking about where you can do your nails, where you can blow-dry your hair, where you can buy a basic T-shirt, where you can buy couture, where you can buy shoes, where you can buy kids' clothing. It doesn't exist. Whereas in the UK, when the property market hits and, you know, everyone was kind of losing their houses, weren't able to get a mortgage. The only thing that kept the UK at bay was fashion. food, beverage, fashion. And it wasn't that Gucci, that Louis Vuitton lady, she's always going to be there. That, that lady is always going to shop Gucci. She's always going to have that disposable income. But that girl that just brought a house, got a mortgage, she can't wear Gucci anymore because her mortgage has just gone up. So she has to now go to H&M, Primark, Zara. It kept everyone afloat. Restaurants kept everyone afloat. But I feel like we, we're missing, that. that's really missing. And then also with the brands that want to come in, it's hard for people to come into Nigeria. I mean, I've, people like Shirosky have wanted to come in. They can't. Boots, Topshop. And that's because our currency fluctuates. We don't, the, the, in terms of the income that the ev everyday Joe or the everyday male or female makes out here, it doesn't weigh up no. to what that lady wants to pay for a t-shirt, also you've got, you've got the rent costs, you've got a lady that's paying high rent, but she wants to look nice. You've got the woman that owns the shop, you know, she wants to do more for her shop, but her rent is expensive. Whereas why can't the government offer re retail spaces at a discounted price? Why can't they realize that if you do that, you're not just putting money into that owner's pocket, you're putting money into your, to your own pocket because we're the same people that will travel to America, you go to London, you go to Zara, and you will buy without even thinking about it. And you'll bring that back and you wear it in Nigeria, but you will never walk into a Nigerian store and spend that same amount because it's impossible. All right, well, let me t tell you what, what I, what I think, I mean, it's, I think it's bigger than this forum here, but I do know that the government is trying to do what they can. Yes, because it's not just fashion this is affecting, it's like it's every other sector. Yeah. Um, but we are actually still quite young. We're pretty young, like across board, like in, in all the sectors, to be quite honest. And the yeah. one that brings in the most money that they recognize and understand is oil and gas. Yeah. Yeah. And we're competing with oil and gas. However, I do know for a fact that they're doing, they're trying to do the best they can. So for instance, if you go to the bank of industry, you can get money, or there's some institutions that will give you money. However, I know for a fact that a whole bunch of designers don't even have businesses set up. How many of you have your businesses incorporated right now? How many people are paying taxes? How many? See, can you see? There's only that. You know, a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't keep their books. How many of you keep your books? How many people have done audited accounts for the past three years? Very few. So quite frankly, you go to a bank, and when they're asking all these questions, we're like, oh, OK. Yeah. Yes. And an account officer is looking at you saying, well, the general impression they have is that we are mm, these bored housewives, these uh, young guys that just want to be funky. You all are just playing. They haven't recognized that it's a serious business yet because there's too few people in it that are making it look like it's serious. We haven't turned around that much money yet for them to actually stand up and pay attention. So the onus is on us right now to make sure that we do. I tell young people, if when the people come to us now, if you haven't really registered your company, please don't come here. I'm like, why are you here? What are you doing here? Because quite frankly, if they cannot see that there's this company, they can't track your finances, can't look at your audited accounts, how would they know you exist? You don't exist. So I don't blame the government in that regard. There's, there's not much that they can do. Yes? 
trademarking of your of your brand yeah. and your product. So that's why for Lagos Fashion Week, a lot of international buyers and press come to Nigeria, they sit front row at Lagos Fashion Week and they will steal every single design. Do you know why they yes. can do it? Because not one Nigerian designer trademarks their brand. Their they don't trademark their designs. Yes. So I know, for instance, that there's a particular Nigerian designer that Stella McCartney co copied probably about three years ago and her whole entire range was exactly the same as that Nigerian designer. But let me tell you the problem too. I'm sorry, because I know, I know this particular one and I know a couple of others, but again, I'm gonna tell it like it is. We are doing all these things. So I, all these runway shows, I'm kind of like, they're nice and wonderful and it's okay. But what happens? But I feel, can we kindly just stop exposing our inadequacies to the whole yep. world? Yep. Because we are. I agree. It looks nice and funky. They're not buying from you. When they actually want to come and buy from you, they can't. So a buyer comes to you and says, okay, I need 2,000 pieces in six weeks. You cannot produce it. But you have structured the runway, sure. wonderful 20 pieces, and then, you how much you you, yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah, but you can't. You can't produce for them. So literally, I mean, what they're doing is having a good time when they come now. Like she said, the people are coming. They're like, all right, this maybe looks good. And they take it and they copy it and there's nothing you can do. This one, this woman cried and she cried. I just don't cry. I'm like, all right, honey. But yes, you didn't do it on your own. You were waiting for them. Produce this stuff and take it to them. Offer it to them yourselves. But no, we, we don't have that capacity. Please do not be fooled. We need to get there, though, but we don't have it yet. Do not be fooled by all you're seeing and hearing. It is still growing. It is still on you to move this, this industry forward. For the government for, yes, for the government to... Do not please look at any of the big wigs that you think that are big. Mm, no. Yep. no. The, the economics don't make sense for the government at all. Uh, speaking from my experience, I used to work in investment banking before. We take a look at hard numbers, right, in terms of what, how industries are performing. Uh, fashion doesn't even come close to the page, right? It's not even a concern, right? If it were a concern, it would likely be in retail, likely textiles, right? Because that we get volume, right? Where manufacturing. You can, yeah, manufacturing. And that's as close as it gets. But like the independent sole designer in the side street, you know, no, not even a concern. So essentially what she's saying, you have to make it yourself, right? And it's rough, right? And you're going to go through a lot of ups and downs, but you're finally going to pull it off. And the reason why I say that is, is that... Uh, creativity takes a lot of courage, right? And self-doubt kills creativity, right? So you're kind of in a whammy, right? Like, what do I do, <laughs> right? Because I have something to create. I want to share it with the world, but I don't have the, I guess, the confidence and wherewithal to put it out there, right? Um, this is where, I guess, all the points we've been making come, in, come into play about perseverance, yes, and the confidence to push through, but also thinking about the smaller outlets we just discussed, like Grey Velvet becomes a very strong influencer in getting your product out there. Right? If it's menswear you're making, I guess we become, we become the, the player, right? But you've got to think that, especially in the digital space, since this is the, the topic of discussion, that if you have the right platform and the right storytelling, you have access to beyond Nigeria. That's, that's the play. You have access to beyond Nigeria. That's kind and, of helped me a lot. Right? Uh, I have friends who are designers. Uh, I don't want to mention any names, but 90% of their sales come from outside of Nigeria. And they're based here, working here in Ikeja. Right? And folks who are getting their products know they're out of here because they have a good story to tell and they rely on the outside of Nigeria macroeconomic factors to be able to pull it off. Right? And you have to think big. I mean, that's, uh, that's the only way to, to, to get there. If you think Nigeria is your only audience, I mean, you're probably in the wrong room today, I assure you. Mm -hmm. right? You need to actually start thinking bigger because when you think about it, in America, half of the the niche stores and the boutiques, everything is produced in America. In the UK now, River Island, retailers, they have a made in Britain range. And going back to um, what she was talking about in terms of brands not having enough to produce to sell out of Nigeria, there's a particular Nigerian brand that I once worked with and Topshop were interested in taking uh, probably about three or four pieces from her range and selling it. The woman was like, oh, oh no, what do I do? I can't perform that many, I can't um, produce that many pieces in a short period of time. And I'm like, what was the whole point of you doing the runway show? You know, it, you know you're doing all of this on social media. You spent loads so of money, hold on, hold but on, yet guys. you can't produce 2,000 pieces. Which, which is understandable. So not everyone has the capacity, as you write these, hold on, has the capacity to do what you guys are saying. 
And since Yoma, you are... I'm sorry. By the time you're <laughs> strutting and calling yourself an Which international designer... You should, exactly. Two thousand capacity. Please, no, 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 I'm very sorry. That's an excuse. Tokyo, okay, that's an excuse because at the end excuse. of the day, it's don't, no, really no, don't, it's don't hit the runway. Oh, it's an excuse. Don't, don't hit, hit the, the runway. runway. Don't, if you don't cannot start your brand. Pieces. Yeah, that means no, you're you starting don't. off with a small okay. mindset, oh, saying you to yourself, not. you're only yes. going to sell in Nigeria. So you're not going to you better yeah. your brand by only being yes. stuck in one region. LFDW, arise. You know these buyers are coming. And you tell me you are not prepared to produce those pieces. Why are you there? But I which... Which, which, is under, which is understandable, but not everyone, yeah. like, not um. everyone has the opportunity to say, okay, you know what, since I can't produce 2,000 bra- pieces at a go right about now, I'm going to outsource it to another country or, or, do, or have those infrastructures or have those things there. But, which is un- but I don't personally feel that it's a situation whereby they shouldn't start their brands. We should no. work I'm, at... I'm yeah, not saying, they, no, I'm not saying to. that they shouldn't, I'm not saying that they shouldn't start their brands, but when, when starting off a brand, like there's, su- there's something in the, manu- in the manufacturing industry called a critical path. Of course. So that yeah. critical path, you work backwards from yes. the delivery date that it hits the retailer. Yes. You then work all the way back to the, the second that you buy the product. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you place your dates um. in when your sample is going to be available, when it's going to be boxed, when you're going to put your labels in. Of course. You should have a critical path for your business and know, okay, I've started my business in the first year. I'm not going to show at a Rise or Lagos Fashion Week in the second year because financially I'm not ready to, to um. go bigger. In the fourth year, I would have bro- I, I, I broken even which means I can now do the fashion shows. So if any buyer is sitting front row and they're interested, I can churn out that product. But the problem that, that we have at the moment is that that woman or that man, they want to do everything in that first year. It's yeah, impossible. It's, it's all course. for publicity. Yeah, exactly. It's all for publicity because I, I see why designers would want to do it. I mean, it's the most applauded platform out there. You could probably be on, even if you can't support the orders to come, at least it gives you some kind of publicity. So I can see, I guess, the... Um, the reason to go for it, right? Our market itself doesn't allow, our market allows for you to get into production of 2,000, 4,000, 5,000 pieces. But like she just said, you have to have created the back or the legwork before to be able to pull that off, right? You're taking a big bet by having your, your models walk that runway, right? Uh, and it's a bet you can win on the spot only if your preparation was intact, right? Uh, and I feel particularly that Nigeria offers you the opportunity to get that right, right? We're big on textiles and cotton and all these other you know, materials available, uh, but we just have uh, too many small businesses but not enough giants, I feel, in that industry, right? Uh, if you had a huge fashion player, a strong fashion player who actually got orders on a consistent basis for the past five years, you'd probably find a factory somewhere in Badagri creating that stuff, right? Uh, uh, but I feel like we don't have that yet, or maybe I just haven't seen it yet. Um, it exists. It does exist. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, then maybe the issue is that it's not, it's not being catered to the designers who are creating the products we see on the runway, right? And what we see on the runway are those, I guess, the mesh and the other more alternative cuts that can't be mass produced, at least not with the tailoring skills we have locally. I, I don't know. No, but, uh, I don't think it's that at all. I think they're just not prepared. And let's call a spade a spade. They're not prepared for it. It's pretty much a case of where I want to be seen, which you said, and that's fine. I don't have a problem if you want to be seen, be seen. But the problem is the bigger picture for me and what bothers me the most, especially when I'm talking to international designers and international stores, is we are now a laughing stock, and that's not a joke. And it's going to affect you younger people. It's, so it needs to stop. It's, 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 we need to stop trying to show off and come to the table and be ready for business. Yeah, think, think yeah. more, think, think less about, you know, what your friend's gonna see or yes. you're starting your business based on, oh, your friend or your yes, friend or this person see this. You need, you need to think, you need to think bigger, think yes. bigger. Think, I wanna be in Nigeria for the next three years, but then after Nigeria, I wanna go to Ghana oh or I wanna go to Zimbabwe, I wanna go to SA, you know. The thing is, you're even saying that, I'm telling you for free, like I have a factory, we have a factory in Lekki. We produce over 2,000 pieces as we speak, I was telling somebody, we don't even meet capacity right now. We are sold out on every single thing, every week, every day. There is space, so when I say, it, uh, it's painful. <laughs> but the, th- the thing is, we haven't surfaced this country. I keep saying we've, we've not even scratched the surface. We haven't. And people just don't realize it's that big of a business. 
that you can sit down and decide as a designer, if you want to make upwards of 10M a month, 20M a month, you can. You can. And you know, thinking, oh, no, I can't, or, oh, I don't have money. Like she said, you start small. I mean, when we started five years ago, oh, it really wasn't that, <laughs> we weren't making that much. But it's different. I take my brand, for example. I remember at the time I was playing around with it. And I was like, oh, I don't really care. And we do five pieces a month or whatever. I'm doing over 700 pieces a month now, and I can't keep up. Do you know what I mean? And I didn't even set out to be a designer. So imagine if you do, if you sit down and put pen to paper and work it out, you will find the finance, you will find the buyers, you will have everything you want, but get ready for it. The market is there. It is there. I don't want Topshop coming. I don't want Boots coming. I don't want H&M coming because we are here. Come on. Why? I don't want ASOS. Oh, yes, I'm one of those fighting the government right now. I don't want any international brand here. We need to be able to grow. No, we need I'm sorry. To start, then, then if that's the case, then we need to start doing business. Yes, we need to know, start doing business. The same way and that guys, those big retailers me, and brands have done we it. We cannot even service ourselves enough right now. No, we can't. So all of you have a chance. If you feel you want to do it and you want to do it seriously, or you will make serious money. And you will make serious headway if you want to. So I'm going to throw this out to the audience now. If you guys have an itching question, let's ask those questions. Okay. Uh, my name is Manny. I would like to ask, uh, considering how technology is influencing brand models, is, he, is a business plan required or necessary for a fashion brand? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, dear. is that a trick question? <laughs> exactly. Is it, is I mean, it, if, you don't, if you don't have a business plan, then don't bother starting no, your business. No, don't bother. Because how, how are you going to know if you put like 10,000 into that business, how are you going to know without a business plan when you're going to make that back? How are you going to know how big your business is going to be? I always say to people, when you are thinking of starting a business plan, minimum five years. Because I'm telling you, you will not break even for the, for the first probably two years or so. So you need a business plan. It's, it's, you, you yeah, yeah it's, you don't have a choice. A Actually, to, to even further expand on that, apart from like a proper typical business plan, your financials are the most important. Yeah. An income statement is really important for you. Profit and loss, whatever, you need to have that. You need to understand what management accounting is. Because otherwise, you do not know where you are. And if you don't know where you are, you're in trouble. You might think you're selling a lot. You might think, oh, I sold 10 pieces last month. So I've made this XYZ amount of money. Uh, probably not. No, you've probably spent a whole lot more. It also lets you, um, it also allows you make decisions you need to make to move in different directions. Do you know what I mean? So you might find, all right, and like I tell people a lot, if you, don't do, if you don't have stock reports as designers, like knowing what pieces you have and what pieces are selling the most and what pieces are not doing too badly or what's that doing really badly, if you don't have those figures, you will just keep creating. So maybe you're just churning out that bad dress that nobody's buying and nobody's liking, but there you are, you're just saying, <laughs> you're moving, <laughs> you're great. And you're thinking to yourself, because you've sold two good ones, you think, yes, that bad one is among them. You will not know and you will not realize unless you have these numbers. So you have to, I tell every young person here, if you do not know finance, you do not know accounting, get somebody to create income statements for you at the very minimum because there's a whole bunch more that you need. Balance sheets are good, those are extra. And understand them. I tell people it's easy for you to actually even do it in Excel. Work out your income and your expenses. Literally track that every single month, every single week if you have to. Stay on top of it because that tells you exactly where you are with your business. So my friend, no business plan is no business. Hello everyone. Okay, the Nigerian workforce ranging from ages 20 to 60 um, usually wear Western outfits to the office. This is like 60% um, of our youths in Nigeria. As um, fashion influencers, do you have any plans to influence this industry? Because I feel at the point where the banks are able to wear Ankara lovely dresses to work and um, jackets that are made of Ankara fabrics, the industry, the gram, the fashion industry is actually going to have a boom. And we do have that traffic that is in Zara, in Nigeria. Yeah. I think that's a great question. Uh, it's something we actually have to deal with at Agbada.com. Uh, because Monday to Thursday, you're allowed to wear your suit and tie, right? And Friday is when you're 
allowed to wear a traditional. Our hope is that someday we can flip it, right? That you'd have guys coming in Monday through Friday, hopefully in an Agbada or Kaftan, right? And then maybe Friday you have, you have, you have the rest. I feel like if, uh, the reason why I say this is important is because if we were to dwell on African wear alone, not African inspired wear, African wear alone, we would have a thriving retail industry and fashion industry, right? The reason why we are here today is because we, we merge both, right? And a lot of tailors, I feel, they struggle with like what their customer, I guess, wants or demands, right? Uh, my thought is that uh, uh, to get us there, to uh, where we can see it on a more regular basis, it would have to be some kind of institutional change, right? Where, it's, uh, where Access Bank says, oh, it's fine. You know, come in on Monday with your brother, we welcome you, right? That's, that's a long shot, it's, it's a long shot. Right, so um, quite a long shot. Yeah. Um, good morning, good afternoon, sorry. Uh, my name is Ursula Sebastian. I'm a blogger and fashion blogger and YouTuber. My question is actually directed at Ms. Uh, Charmaine. Um, I'm very interested in the business side of fashion. Um, I would most likely never churn out the product, but I've always been interested in business. Now, in t this is 2018, and like five years ago, nobody really knew much about um, influencer marketing, for instance. But um, my question is, now in 2018, what strategies would you say that people should employ to be positioned for the near future? Because digital age is changing, like every, as we speak, is changing. So what futuristic plans or strategies would you advise people interested in business side of fashion to, you know, um, put in place to be prepared for the changing times that we're in? You, could really, you can't really ever be prepared. I mean, that's impossible. We, who would have known that Instagram would have been a big part of every influencer's life, every brand's life? So you can't really be prepared. You can only prepare yourself for more business, more work. You have to keep yourself busy. And you know, if you're, as you said, you're a blogger, YouTuber, follow the brands that you're interested in working with. Um, if you're on social media, if you're on Instagram, tag those brands you know, see what they're doing, see how they're interacting with their consumer. Um, you just, you have to kind of do your research and think forward in terms of the industry that you want to go into or the brands that you want to start working with. You need to be moving at the same pace that they are, know what they're interested in, know what they like, know what they don't like. It's, it's impossible. I don't even think Instagram can even keep up with themselves in terms of what they're doing. I mean, Facebook have Facebook Live, but they're, they've just started this up for, for fashion and celebrities. It's, it's huge. You've got, people on, you've got celebrities on there that are doing makeup tutorials. You've got chefs on there that are doing cook, cooking tutorials. Facebook only started this probably, what, two years ago? They didn't actually realize how big it would be. So it just goes to show how fast, you know, social media is moving. So all I can, my advice to you would just be, be prepared to always move at that fast pace, basically. Um, my name is Chemaka. Um, my question is, as a young fashion designer, and I get an opportunity to um, showcase my product and brand through the wrong way, but I don't have the income to, to produce more, like you said, that those who go on the wrong way should be prepared to produce more than what they actually show on the wrong way. So how do I go about such situation when I get an opportunity? to showcase my brand on the wrong way. Let me ask you a question I ask a lot of young fashion designers. Why do you want to step out as a brand on your own right now if you don't have the resources? Um, my question is, um, if I get an opportunity, like the GC factory and all the fashion, um, I mean, the GC fashion shows and other um, fashion shows around, I get an opportunity to showcase my work as a young graduate and really find my design very interesting and quite creative and also to showcase my product. And I have the means to showcase my product, but financially to produce more than the particular design I have, I don't have the means to produce more. Now, what do I do in that kind of situation? So I'm asking you a question. I, I, ask, I ask people these questions because they're really serious. Are you a fashion designer or are you a business person? They're kind of sometimes they're two different things. So right now you're just talking about fashion design. They've allowed you to showcase nice and wonderful. Shay, you wanted to just showcase. So yeah, you're showcased. <laughs> Did you have any plan for it to be a business? Did you ever think that those designs could be commercially viable for you? They could make you money? It would become a business? 
Yes, ma'am. I've actually thought about that. So, my, I'm a fashion designer, mm -hmm. and I actually look at the business part of it too. Like not just to design, talk, not just to design. I also look at the business part too. So, whereby I get an opportunity to showcase my. What do I do? Okay, so let me tell you what. I, I, I'm going to be really honest here. You need to have saved up enough money or found the money to be able to do it. If you haven't, I don't see any reason why you would have even gone on that runway. I tell a lot of young fashion designers, if you don't have money, have you considered working with another, with another brand, being like a creative person there, being a fashion designer there? We take fashion interns, we take design interns all the time. Many companies do. You don't necessarily have to be about your own brand all the time, do you? John Galliano wasn't for the longest time. Mark Jacobs wasn't for the longest time. Most people don't realize there's a lot of money to be made as well, just working in an industry in the, different, um, in the different job areas that there are. We pay fortunes to people who are going to be good designers. I don't have a problem with that. We're always happy <laughs> to hire them. So have you, have you thought about that? There are lots of fashion houses, so you can, you can approach people and get a job. Save up money, two, three years, four years, whatever, five years, maybe ten. I also tell people, why don't you consider actually even staying with another brand and maybe even becoming a creative director there where you make a, sorry, excuse me, I was about to swear, but Ernie, you make a lot of money. <laughs> okay, so you can make a lot of money there. It's a career path in itself, and we don't really understand that. If I had a choice, I would not be a designer, and I would not be working for anybody. I would not have my own business. I'd be working for somebody else. I really would. That is the God honest truth. Because you don't seem to understand that business is business, whether it's fashion or anything else. It comes with quite a bit. There's quite a bit. A lot of times at night when we're thinking about where the salary is going to come from or whether this order is going to work, whether this is going to happen. No, I'd rather be working with somebody. So have you considered that? You don't necessarily have to be this designer with their own store, with their own brand. I don't know. I think, I think that's just... It's, it's a lot. And when you think of it, using someone of a, as an example, someone like Karl Lagerfeld, for instance, he only started up his own brand, what, five years ago? Up until five years, he was the creative director and head designer for Chanel. He still does it because that's his bread and butter. He hasn't got a choice. But as for his own brand, even that, he doesn't carry the, finan the financial strain on his back. Everything is licensed out. So other companies produce it for him. He just signs off the designs, yep, I like that, and, and, and it's done. So you've, you've, you've kind, of, kind of, going back to what this lady asked me, you've, you've got to think outside the box, you've got to be forward thinking. You don't always have to own a store. You don't always have to create your own pieces or work for your own brand. Go into, go into another um, industry, go, sorry, go into another company. Be like a creative director, sure, be sure. a designer, because don't think that, oh, because you're working for another company, you're not going to be able to do what you want to do. If you go into that company and you're working on the creative side of things, you're creating product that you like, that you want, that you wanted for your own brand. The difference is you've got someone else that's carrying the financial burden for you. I think a big part of it is really understanding the fashion industry as a whole. Because when people say they want to work in fashion, they assume it's just you grabbing material and, and playing with it. Uh, I particularly don't know how to sew or even know how to pick material. I have not a single clue. I sell a lot of agbada on the daily, but I don't even know how to make one, right? Uh, to be honest, I don't, even, I don't even own an agbada, which is crazy, right? But I understand the business of retail and the business of fashion, right? So you have to really break down the entire industry and say, where can I play based on my skill sets that still places me within the industry and gives me the kind of skills I need to get the other bigger type position or the, you know, like the kind of position I would dream for. And maybe on the side, you're working on your designs, and eventually you want to push that to the forefront and make that successful. But at least you have to start somewhere that places you in the industry and not necessarily, necessarily I guess, the star player you hope to be on day one, right? Uh, start small, start small. And, and I would say another thing I wanted to mention for the lady over there is uh, uh, intelligence matters, right? I know digital is happening, it's happening so fast, but you would actually find intelligent content as to what the next wave is going to be. And it's up to you to decide which one you believe in or not, right? In some cases, believe the hype, right? It's coming, right? You think Instagram is on top right now? It wasn't 10 years ago, so obviously something new is going to come, right? So you got, you got to play ahead of the game. Think ahead of the curve consistently. And it's tough, especially for people I find in fashion, creatives, it's very, very tough to separate the business part, the marketing part, and the fashion part. I mean, it's, it's a lot. Your, your brain has to work in silos. Right? You have to completely compartmentalize 
all the different parts it takes to run a fashion business. From the get-go, from day one, it's looking at it from an overview, 50,000 feet view, and saying, where do I fit in? And where does the big picture take me? Uh, but that's the way to look at it. Uh, I hope that made sense. Okay, okay um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for all the information you've given to us. Really appreciate it. Um, I want to ask, for someone that is planning to start a fashion retail outfit, what advice would you give to that person, you know, in terms of um, how to um, get um, engaging and business contracts with um, brands, you know, how to showcase their products to get sales and all of that, you know? What, what, what kind of advice would you give to someone who just want to start out? Um, it, it, it's a lot. It depends. It's, it's pretty much the way you set it up. I remember when we set us up in the beginning, um, it was pretty much a case that it was all just going to be concessions. And it's really quite straightforward, to be quite honest. You have contracts with the people. You have to decide whether you're buying the stock from them or whether you're having like a sale or return agreement. It's usually one of the two. Most people now, if you don't have the resources, they think you're not going to buy. So chances are to be a sale or return. You have to work out, based on your figures, you'll work out exactly what it is you're going to take from them. So are you taking just commission? Are you doing rent as well as commission? We do rent as well as commission. Um, and work out what works best for you financially. Yeah. That's the only way to do it. You kind of have to work backwards. So take your rent and everything else into account and then work backwards as to how many people you need to get into the space, right? And how much you need to charge to be able to make the money you want. But I tell you for free, and I'm going to tell everybody this because... Um, I, told you, I have to tell everybody the truth. The concession business, grey velvet business, using a concession is a failure. It doesn't work because the numbers are way too low to make it work. So the way we make money now, literally like the Nordstroms and the Selfridges, is with our own brands. Our brands sustain us, not that rent and commission. So be careful. Um. I have to underscore how much of an important point she just made. Uh, it's probably the biggest statement made in this room today, right? Uh, as far as I understand your business model, very, I looked at Wolfram Badger and those other players, so I really get it. Uh, she, just hit, uh, she just hit the nail right on the head, right? In which case, it's, it just shows how scrappy she is, right? She would do whatever it takes to pull it off. Guys, if you work in the fashion space, you got to own your stuff, right? You got to own your stuff. I find that uh, people who are creative are the most confident, but also the most insecure. It's kind of crazy, right? We, you'd never find, I mean, you look at like Kanye West or any major celebrity, they are so insecure. At the same time, they've accomplished so much. How is that even possible? Anyway, that's a question for another no, day. Let me tell you how. They're successful. A lot of them are successful because you need to understand who you are and what your capabilities are. I find creative people, the majority of creative people are not business people. All right? So what you do is make sure you have the business manager, friend, whatever, or who you employ. It doesn't work. Jimmy Choo, you would never have known if it wasn't for Tamara Mellon. Yep. <laughs> he literally one Chinese man just making shoe judge in one corner. Nobody knew who he was. He too was, uh, you know, until this socialite lady comes along and she's like, oh my God, I love these. And boom, that was it. So, again, if you know you're that creative person, and we fully understand you people that take your designs and you're massaging them every day, and, oh, I don't really know, and I don't know. <laughs> mm, no. You guys need that business person who's stopping you, who's making you, bringing you back to center all the time, getting you focused in what you need to do. So, I tell people, don't try and be what you're not. I'm not a designer. I'm not that creative. Or they say I'm kind of a mix. Maybe I am. But I'm more of the business side. I couldn't care less. To me, clothes are apples and oranges, tomatoes, pepper. And that's how I see them. Literally, every sketch I see for me, how much is that? That's what I care about. Yes, I love it after. <laughs> you know, no, afterwards, in. I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. So, oh, yeah, that, that hemline is nice. What's it going to retail for? I don't get that emotionally tied to anything, but some of you do. So get that business manager. So it comes back down to how we talked about collaboration. So you might have a friend um, that is an auntie Isioma that is just like, where's the number? So you that you're a designer and you, who's the other person that is more concerned about business around there? We should talk Bad, yeah. <laughs> and share numbers. Um, so this is, again, a digital question. So what recent tools has had the, biz the biggest impact on how you create digitally? Um, for Auntie Isioma, in relations to 
as a designer also because you've never um, you never really wanted to get into design, but now you're in it. Um, how has the digital actually imp impacted your business and what are the tools you're currently using? I'm just going to ask it all together. Um, Ismaila, for you, um, it's more how are you using the digital to run Heritage Circle and Agbada.com? And Charmaine, um, how do you find the digital um, when it comes to at least, let's not talk about the most established people. When you see someone that you absolutely believe in and you grow them from scratch, how, how, what platforms or what things do you feel that you do or that is necessary in order to get them to that point where globally they're recognized? Like any modern business now, I think literally across board, everyone is digitalized, everything is. Um, in, my, in the factory, Pretty much everything is, we haven't moved a lot of the machinery over to the digital age yet because it's been quite expensive. We're like, no thanks, um, not yet. <laughs> but um, as much as we can, like all the stores literally have the POS machines to a certain extent, so there's one of them that doesn't. Um, but in every other way, when I'm dealing with my management staff, marketing and everything now, we use a platform called Trello. So you don't always have to be in the same space, but we know what's going on. All our activities are uploaded. Everybody knows what they need to do. Everyone knows what's happening at a point in time. Um, same thing in the factory. We have it all. Everything's digitalized from the cutting schedule to the sewing schedule, the finishing schedule. Literally everything is. So to be quite honest, I think I don't think there's, there's hardly any business now, I think, that literally isn't running digitally. I don't think so. I want no different. Um, but just just to stay in that, like, okay, so as it is digital, how, how has it helped, like, with even with digitalizing payment options and, and how you've been able to get money in um, e-commerce-wise and stuff like that? Because I know you, you both have a physical and you sell a lot online. Right. So um, what, what methods and how is that all working out? Well, it's just, I mean, the, all, all the methods have been there, like, things like Vogue Pay now, PayPal is pretty big for us, like internationally, nobody wanted to use any of the, uh, you know, the platforms, even Vogue Pay, they still don't really like it, but PayPal is pretty cool. Um, I won't even talk about five years ago when we started, literally it was all cash. We hardly take any cash in now, so everybody's using every possible way they can. We're doing transfers, they're using obviously the POSs, um, there was this thing, um, pay with capture, access bank, um, you know, so trust, <laughs> trust me, like across board now, it's just, it's, it's even hard to think how we used to function before. All those things are there now and they're pretty basic. So if anybody's even building like an online store for you and an e-commerce platform and is trying to make a big deal out of like what the payment options are, like why? They literally even just come with it now. You're hardly paying anymore before we had to pay. Like you pay like 150K or something now is free. Yeah. Um, so a lot of it, 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 a lot of it has changed. A lot of it has. Uh, everything she just said, right? Um, for Heritage Circle is an online platform. Uh, first of all, is it being an online platform in the first place, right? Is digital, right? And the fact that we can create and uh, and mold it the way we want in a very easy way is a big part. So the whole idea of creating a website today for your business is not a big deal. It was before, but if anyone is charging you too much, they're, they're messing with you, right? Uh, so the online platform is one thing, but also what are the add-ons, the bolt-ons to make it successful? Uh, like uh, she was just mentioning Pay With Capture and you know, PayPal and all these other players. Uh, what I found is that, uh, what we found at Heritage Circle, uh, being that we focus on, on African men on the continent and abroad, is that they need any kind of payment option they want to use, we're ready to take, right? You want to wire cash? I got the account ready. Uh, you want to uh, uh, SMS text-based, we got it ready. You cannot stand in the way of a payment process. Right? You would lose the sale, right? Uh, so on Heritage Circle, that's, uh, that's been established as far as making sure all the optionalities are available across the continent and also internationally. Uh, very important. On, on agbada.com, on the flip side, um, I would say on the online retail side, all those things were going to apply. But what I'm very excited about is where I think the native wear or traditional men's wear or African women's wear industry is going to just based on innovation in, in fabric alone, right? If you think about like uh, how, many, how many men wear Agbada in Lagos on a Saturday, it's Jesus Christ. It's, it's mind blowing, right? Uh, you extend that to let's say Kano where they wear it on a daily basis where it's like a uniform, it's, it's a lot, right? Uh, you think about it being a West African product 
Jesus, it's massive, right? So we got to ask ourselves, like, how do you build innovation around an industry that big that serves so many people in a way that, you know, even tailors who are like on the side streets and tailors who have their own shops can understand that POSs do matter, right? And text-based transfers do matter. And all that is built into a network designed to support them, right? So I'm very excited about, you know, what we have currently in terms of the bolt-ons to online retail, but I'm very excited about how we I guess how we figure out digitization in the vertical industry of retail and fashion itself, right? Am I making sense? Right? Yes, the whole are. idea of like, how are these fabrics being produced and how has it been distributed, right? And what's the cost of it? Because if you get that right, economics could come down significantly, of right? Course. And you open up the channel to a lot more players who are interested in this industry. Is making so, sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So what was your actual question? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> like, what's the question? Um, so the, basically the question was the role of the digital in the sphere and how, for instance, at least for you as someone that manages brands and talent, how, for instance, if you saw a kid that you actually like and they have talent, what would you do? Or how, what are the things you would do in order to get them to that global stage? Well, when you, kind of, when you find someone, you, you're finding them and you're picking them for a reason because you can see the, the potential. So in terms of grabbing talent from when they're young, that would more or less be on our modeling side of things because okay. we scout models from like the age of 14 and then we build you up to get ready for the runway, to get ready for editorial. But in terms of talent, I go after exist, like talent that are already, yeah, they're established. Um, and then for me, if you're an established talent, for instance, so working with someone like Lorraine Pascal or Michael Bublé, they're open to working with everything but then I have to kind of put my brand hat on. Like Lorraine Pascal wouldn't expect her to go into the fashion side of things. It would be more for me to build kitchen textiles, home fragrance, because you look at her as a homely woman. Someone like Michael Bublé, for it, but he can go into music, fashion. So it, it all boils down to if you're a talent, you need to understand what you're good at and why people are interested in you. There'd be, there'd, there's no point of people being interested in you because you wear stylish shoes, but then you want to open up a hat brand. Do you get what I mean? Of course. So it's, it's, it's very simple. Just find what you're good at and stick to it. Because most of the time when you try and think outside the box and then you go the complete opposite way, you, you're kind of missing your blessing in a way. Do you understand? Like, of course. That would be you, for instance, Tokyo. You're very talented. You're a talented designer. So, but it would be funny for you to turn around and say, oh, I want to go and open up a restaurant. So you need to understand what, what you're looking for. You need to understand that the end goal. And then in terms of social media, whatever you're going after, start following that on so social media. Let it show within your social media. Don't just go out there and start following people because they've got big names. It doesn't make any sense. Social media for you, if you're a business, it needs, to, it needs to be a business for you. You need to open social media and you're following people that are going to benefit you and that, are going to, you're, that you're going to learn from, basically. Whereas if you're... A, so if you're a designer, for instance, you don't just follow someone that's at the top, like your Celine, your Givenchy. Follow up and coming Nigerian designers. You know, understand how they grew and where they came from and how they got to where they are today. So you kind of have to be very versatile when it comes to the whole social media side of things. Fantastic. Ismaila, I'm gonna ask you this one directly. Um, finance. I am a strong believer that fashion and money should be best of friends. <laughs> um, coming from an investment banking point, how can someone, what are the, because fashion needs a lot of money even just to start it up, what are the things or the recipes, what's, what's the right terminology to use in order for these young designers, for young designers um, to get them started? This is a very touchy subject because I feel everyone in this room, uh, if you're a fashion creative, you likely have to worry about financing, right? Is that true? Okay. Um, if you don't have money today, you're not ready for it. Let that sink in. Please let that sink in. If you don't have money today, you're not ready for it. Ooh, ouch, it hurts, right? It's the truth though, right? Uh, if you've gotten to a stage where uh, the business is moving and you need some more cash to take it to the next level, money will come to you because you've shown work that deserves to be funded and invested in. Now, if we want to rewind back and say from the beginning, how do you get started? That's a completely different question, right? Friends, family, 
angel financing some funds available, right? Small loans from, you wouldn't get anything from a bank, very unlikely, right? So it'd have to be from people who know you and trust you and believe in your dream. That's the most likely way you'd get started. But if you're, let's say, three, four, five years, 10 years in the game, and you're still struggling to a certain level, it's because you haven't looked out for the right kind of partners to take your business to that next level. And that's what I mean where if you, if you want the money, the money will come to you, right? You have to have, like Grey Velvet, for example, I think you guys are a great investment, at least you look at it from the, from the outside, you look like a great investment opportunity, right? In which case, a player, if I, were, if I had the money, I would say to myself, how do I expand these guys? How do I blow them up, right? They're showcasing a lot of Nigerian designers likely gonna take on African designers in the future. If I put Grey Velvet stores across capital cities in Africa alone, you know, where there are you know, a lot of folks in the residential neighborhood would actually go to the mall and, and buy this, that's an opportunity, right? Uh, and she probably hasn't sought that investment out because she doesn't want it yet, <laughs> right? Uh, who knows? <laughs> right, but my point though is, uh, I'm sorry? Uh, <laughs> It's, what he's saying is true, to be quite honest. I mean, in the beginning, yeah, a lot of you, if you don't have money, then sorry. It really is friends, relatives, you know, anybody who loves you. Get you know, a job. Whether, yeah, you know, get a job, save up your money. I'm still working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, what tends to happen, to be quite honest, if you're serious about your business, this is where we go back to having your financials. After about three to four years, obviously, you've, you can see there's a profit or at least there's a potential for it. If you're then going to seek a loan, your figures will show whether you actually can afford to take that loan. I mean, we took a loan, Up Access Bank. <laughs> <laughs> Access Bank gave us money. Um, and it was, it, was kind of, it was a really straightforward process because we had everything we needed. We had everything, all the audited accounts were there. Everything was there, collateral was there, which you do need. Unfortunately, in the market now, nobody's just going to give you money without securing it, sorry. Right, that's another thing right there. If you can't secure it, so, so sorry. It's not going to happen. However, you can get funding elsewhere. So you can get investors. Again, people who want to come and invest. So either it's like equity or they're loaning you the money. But again, you need to be very serious at that point. If you do not understand what those things mean or the implications of having interest or the implications of having, you know, having your company split up and selling some of it to somebody else or whatnot, then you might get into some trouble. So you need to educate yourself and understand what all that will mean at that point. But it starts with you right now keeping your books and understanding what they are and deciding where you're going. And like he said, if you do want money in the future, if your brand is speaking for itself and it's working, it will come to you. They will beg you to invest in you. Yes, they will. They're like, and they're no, begging me right much. now. It's fun. <laughs> this is across board. What would you say the biggest misconception about fashion is? And what's the strongest truth? Charmaine, I'm going to throw that to you because she's looking at me as like, nigga, really? <laughs> I really did. I probably, <laughs> do you know what? It's social media. Social media <laughs> is the fact that I work in an industry where I work with talent that get paid by big brands to wear their clothes for free and post pictures and travel to hotels and go on private jets and get paid. You would look at that influencer and be like, oh my God, wow, her life is fantastic. And she did. she's getting paid to do it. And I always say it to my younger siblings, just because you see that girl dressed up from head to toe and she's taking a selfie of her outfit, she's probably got a team. I, I represent bloggers that go everywhere with makeup, hair, and a stylist. professional stylist and photographer. Whereas you're going to see her standing in front of a floral arrangement and think, oh my God. She, but whereas it took her probably seven hours to get to that point. So don't always look at social media as something that is real because it's not. It's a business platform. People are on social media to build themselves and build their business. Brands look at social media. Gone are the days where big brands like LVMH, Louis Vuitton, they don't spend, they don't have big marketing budgets anymore. They've, they've slashed that worldwide. So where they spend their money is with influencers. They'd rather, they'd rather pay an influencer 10,000 for them to you know, fly them out to Ibiza for three days, do a dinner for bloggers, then you take a couple of pictures, they give you product to wear, and then you're back on a plane on your way home. And I can guarantee in those three days, that brand has probably sold out of every single product those bloggers have worn at that, at that dinner, at that brunch, because that's how it works. You don't drive around and see big billboards anywhere, like in Europe. People don't have 
the marketing spend anymore. So yeah, I would. I think social media. Yeah, it's it's not all smoke and mirrors, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. I also think as well. But to be quite honest, it does help. So for instance, influencer marketing is pretty cool. Yeah. But I tell a lot of people now: be careful who you're choosing if you're going to use an influencer. All right. There are lots of them that maybe don't have the same values that you have, don't have the same interests, and you just decide, oh yeah, she has 10 million, you know, followers. So yeah, she'll sell my dress. Quite frankly, maybe not. Do you know what I mean? Those 10 million followers, are they the same followers that, you're, that are following yes, your brand? Yes, they're following my exactly. brand. It, it's not going to make sense. You know what I mean? What you're putting, you, it's fashion you're doing, but then you're going to choose a blogger who does hair and makeup. Uh, it's, it's not really going to work. So you be careful. It's, to me, social media, Instagram in particular, is it's, it's a really big liar. And be very, very careful. The other myth you have to have is I find a lot of people think this industry is easy. Like any other, it is not. All right, I really am telling you today, I, this is the best I've looked this year. I wake up every morning at 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm in my trackies and <laughs> slippers and no makeup. Rub it, my hair is cut because I do not have time to do my hair. I literally live in my factory. So if you want to do it, I guess just like any other business, you have to be committed. When you see all those photographs, again, on social media with designers doing the interview and she's fully made up and she's in six-inch heels, <laughs> Not every it's day. not true. <laughs> that is not, you know, then the sketchbook is nicely laid across the table. For us, the sketchbook is on the floor. The pages are all over the place. And we're like, okay, well, what are we doing today? And how's it working? It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not as glossy as it looks. So I tell people, if you want to get into it, it's, not, um, it's really not as glamorous as you think. It is hard work. And you're doing it 24-7. That is actually, I'm going to add to you, even though the question is not to me. I think I remember a time that I was late for a meeting. I flew a bike from literally Aja all the way to Ikeja. I was like, be going. I'm like, you need to go because I need to be at this meeting. One way or the other, I cannot be late. And at that point in time, I didn't, if you saw me, when I got to the meeting, I went into the bathroom, I'm like, okay, wash your face. And, but I thought about it and I'm like, did I literally just, on third mainland bridge, I was on a bike. I'm like, I can't miss this, I can't miss it. For the, and that's how the reality is, that it really isn't glamorous. I've been in days, I'm, I'm sure you've done it, that when I'm in, you're in the market and you're just like, and you've seen people and they're looking at you and I'm like, girl, the hustle is real. What? what, what? <laughs> We're doing this, and that's the real... No, the, most, the, most part, the, the biggest thing that happens to me all the time is people see me and they go, you'll be great velvet. Yeah. You know that disgusted look like, really? <laughs> this? Yeah. But that's, the, but that's the reality, and any designer, on, if you're not born with a silver spoon in your mouth and you really are about this dream, you will get down to the nitty-gritty and make it work. However it needs to work, you will make it happen. Um, on that note, um, I'm going to ask one more question before, after that, we're going to have a talk from our, our Uno guy at the top, as they like to say it. Um, and then we're going to round up with questions, then I'm going to tell you all to go to your houses. <laughs> so the last question, which is a cliche of a question is, you already know. Should we, should we say it together? I don't even think. What advice do you have for the younger generation? <laughs> <laughs> it's a cliche. But really? we have to ask it. Like, so what advice do we have? Do you guys have for these beautiful faces that are here today? Do you really want to hear what I have to say? <laughs> <laughs> like what I tell my own children, do not go into business. Go work for somebody else. Yes, you're going to study law. You're going to study medicine. Go back. Actually, <laughs> no, no, no. The thing is, um, the world is your oyster. You have to believe that. All right? Now, that's the part of social media I believe. You know, what you want, you can get. It is going to take a lot of work. Um, you may not be successful in what you choose to do, but you will end up succeeding at something else. Do you understand? You must never think to yourself you have failed. There are many days I want to quit. Two days ago, I was done. I had abused everybody in Nigeria. I'm going, I'm packing up. I can't stand this country. I hate it. You have to keep going. 
It doesn't matter what it is. And don't be afraid to fail. I failed so many times. It's like my middle name. But it's, you know what I mean? But it's, it's cool. I don't mind it because every time something doesn't work out, I'm like, oh, okay, well, at least I tried. I tell myself, I've told myself since I was 29 that I could die now because I had achieved everything I wanted to. For me now, I'm just it's the icing on the cake I'm licking every day. Been there, done that. Everything you want to do, do it. Do not be scared of anybody. Do not be scared of anything. You have, to, you have to be yourself. I've lived my life unapologetically me. I do not care what anybody has to say. Don't want your advice. Don't care. <laughs> never have, never will. Do you know what I mean? But just make sure you're doing right. Live your life right. Work hard. I don't think there's anything that's going to come to you easy and don't expect that it will. If it does, be happy, but chances are it won't. But go and succeed, because you can. Ismoila, advice. Thank you very much for that. I'm still taking that in myself. I'm still internalizing it. Um, there was something we used to say in the military, uh, especially when things get really rough, which is that um, if you can't, if you can't um, go backwards, you got to go in harder, right? Which is the idea of a tunnel, right? Where you're coming from, you know there's no way. Uh, you're digging through, you can't see what's ahead of you but well, you have faith it's better than what's behind you. So you keep digging, right? And that's the idea, uh, that's, uh, that's something we always um, uh, held on to when things got really rough, uh, that it's gonna get better as we move along. So my, my thought to you is, I guess my last saying to you is, no matter what you're going through now, just realize that uh, it gets better, right? And you just gotta keep pushing through. Uh, success stories only happen because people failed, right? Uh, it's the only way it works. No one just comes out of the blue and just pulls it off. It's not Instagram right? Uh, you're going to have to put in work, right? So my, my, my advice to you is put in the work. And most of all, uh, and this is, goes contrary to what people, I guess, how people are in the fashion space, uh, lose the ego. Lose the ego. Lose the, it's going to stand in the way of your blessing. Let me get biblical for a second, right? It's going to stand in the way of your blessing. Lose the ego. Be humble. Be as humble as, and nice and pleasant as Anyone who meets you has to have something good to say about you. That's what it comes down to. Are you guys with me? All right, thank you. Kind of the same advice, really. Um, I've always had the don't really care what people think kind of attitude because where I am today, a lot of people were like, oh, Charmaine, you know, you're never going to get that far or you can't work for that company or you can't do this or you can't do that. And at one point of my career, I listened to those people. But then after a while, you can't listen to those people because they're not you. They're, they're not going to be you when you get to that, that finish line. And always have that mindset of anything you want is very hard to come by. Anything that you get easy is probably going to be here today and gone tomorrow. So have faith in yourself. But then also for people that are building brands and want to open their own stores, do it because you want to do it. Don't do it and have your friends in mind or, oh, I want to do this for my friends. This person's going to visit my store because I can guarantee out of experience. The people that are going to support you are going to be total strangers. So don't build anything based on family, friends, friendships, because as you climb that ladder, I can guarantee it's a very lonely place at the top. But you know, for your, you know deep down inside you got to the top from your hard work and you're going to reap it. So be honest with yourself, believe in yourself, and just don't let anyone tell you that you're not capable of getting to that end goal. Fantastic. So um, before we do the questions, I am going to have our head of corporate comms, Mr. May. Please, you guys, this is clap. Uh, this is one that pays my bills. <laughs> Thank you. No need for formalities. Um, no need for formalities. First of all, thank you very much, all of you, for coming. I want to ask a question. Does anyone know who my Atafo is? OK. My Atafo and I worked in Guinness, Nigeria, seven years ago. And seven years ago, he would come to work, do his brand manager stuff, but he would also be stitching and drawing and doing all kinds of stuff. He had a passion. And he left the security of 
Guinness Nigeria to go chase that passion. And today we all know who he is. If your wedding dress is not made by, by my, it's not a wedding dress type of thing. So all of you here, and I see all your faces, bright, beautiful, eager to take over the world. Like everyone here has said, you can and you should. But be aware of the fact that an Ohimai didn't just wake up and become who he became seven years later. So you will fall, you will fail, you will cry, you will have totally terrible days. But that's the game. And that's what you need to do to get to where you will get to and be on this panel talking about how, ah, some days ago I struggled or years ago I struggled. That's what it is. To do that, you need obviously support. You need mentors. You need colleagues and people that are in your struggle to help you get there. So here's my pitch. Who here banks with Access Bank? So let me just say this is a dismal number. It's, I, am, I am appalled. And I don't want you here beyond today without banking with us. Let me tell you why. At Access Bank, we provide things like these where you can get educated and inspired, where you can meet people who are also in your struggle, where you can meet someone that says, you know what, I like your story, how can I support you beyond this? They talked about needing money. It won't always come, but Grey Velvet came to us for a loan. A loan is not based on good looks and by God's grace and all of that. A loan is that you're a business person and you've thought through your plan. You know from point A to point Z what your plan is. Because money is hard. And banks don't just give money away because we're not Father Christmas. We'll never be. So if you have a plan, we will listen to you and we will talk and we could support you. But even if we don't, things like these, this conversation we're having now, will be very, very important in the things that you do. We have I see a massive amount of women here. We have women banking. And everything we do is about supporting women and their financial needs. We have forums like this. Now, they've exploded. They're in a very good place now. But you have to start small. You start with what your budget will allow. I see a lot of you on Instagram, and you're all pushing your wares and your products and your personal brands through Instagram. It's free. All you need is your creativity to tell stories that work and people will come to you. As you get more and more attention, then the bigger things happen. But it's a long game. You will not wake up and because God just smiled on you, all of a sudden, instant success. There's no such thing as instant success. It takes years and years of building and crying and praying, but that's what it is. The first thing you should all do right now Get out your phones and go and follow my Access Bank on Instagram. That's the first thing that I want to see you do. So who isn't right now? So if you're not, you get your F for sure, but go and follow us on Instagram. The second thing, if you're not banking with us, because this, this was a gimme, right? But the next time we see any faces here that come for our free advice and counsel session that don't bank with us, we will bounce you. I promise. So I need you, there are people outside that will help you and talk you through opening an account. You should bank with us because we do offer you things beyond just saving your money and giving it to you when you want it. So can I get a, I'm going to bank with you today, Amechi. This is where you all jump and say what I just said. <laughs> But I thank you all for coming. I'm, I hope it was a great session. I thank all of you here. I really do have to run, but nice to meet you all. I think as young designers right now, your main important thing is to create. Create as much as possible in order to start creating an identity for yourself. It's really important because no matter how much you copy, no matter how much you copy, um, no matter how so much someone copies you, it will always come back to be like, you know what, as Ismaila said, everyone knows Ugomoye. And no matter how many people copy Ugomoye's um, Agbada, 
it started off with Ugomoye. So that is it. So always think about that. At this juncture, I am going to say thank you so much for coming to Accelerate Fashion Talk. Sit down, people. <laughs> um, our next one is going to happen in August. So please put this date down, August. Um, mails and everything will be going out to you guys. Um, make sure we have your email addresses. If this was really insightful for you, we're going to have a new bunch of amazing panelists and a new topic to talk about. And if you're not following us on Accelerate TV, please do it at Accelerate underscore TV. Um, and please give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you so much. Oh yeah, go to your house. <laughs>